Hello, and welcome back to Chainlink Research Reports. I'm Dr. Jason Anastasopoulos, a researcher at Chainlink Labs and an assistant professor of public policy and statistics at the University of Georgia. I have two really great guests for you today, Dr. Hannah Halliburta and Dr. Jasun Lee, two economists who have been in the blockchain space for quite a long time and have made very impactful work in that space. Dr. Hannah Halliburta is an associate professor of technology operations and statistics at the Leonard Stern School at New York University. And Dr. Jasun Lee is an assistant professor of finance at the George Mason University School of Business. In the paper that they're presenting today entitled An Economic Model of Consensus on Distributed Ledgers, the authors build an economic model which employs game theory to understand what happens when nodes on a blockchain act strategically rather than honestly, where honest behavior is defined as a node blindly following the blockchain protocol. I really hope that you enjoy the interview and please don't forget to like and subscribe. Now, here's Dr. Halliburta and Dr. Lee. Dr. Hannah Halliburton, please feel free to begin your presentation whenever you'd like. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for the for invitation to uh, present and discuss our research. Um, this is a re joint research with Jason Lee here and also with Jigao He uh, from Chicago School of Business. Um, and this research was inspired by observation that a lot of modern blockchains, uh, blockchains after the proof of work, uh, initial uh, Nakamoto's blockchains, many of them are using Byzantine fault tolerance as the backbone of the consensus protocol. So this would be true for Ethereum 2.0, Hyperledger Fabric, Threadmint recently you know, rebranded to Ignite, uh, but we see many more. And uh, we, we know that uh, Byzantine fault tolerant uh, uh, protocols for reaching consensus are much older than blockchain. Uh, they, they go back to the classic problem of uh, Byzantine generals problem that goes back to the 70s and solution, late 70s and solutions go back to the early 80s. Um, and this is all about getting independent computers to communicate and uh, achieving consensus on the state of the ledger database. So they uh, those uh, Byzantine fault tolerant, tolerant protocols have been used in databases since that time. Um, but there is a new and renewed interest in Byzantine fault tolerant protocols uh, because of their applications to blockchains. Because you know, blockchains are a type of distributed databases, but they are very specific type of distributed databases because uh, uh, as we are going to, to talk about, the nodes need to be incentivized to follow the protocol. So uh, Byzantine fault tolerant uh, uh, protocols, the, the older type, can give, a, give us guidance for designing blockchain protocols, but we need to think about very important modifications. So the crucial difference uh, that we are observing between traditional databases and uh, blockchains is the difference in adversarial environment. The traditional distributed databases that were created and set up within particular company uh, were considering possibility that some nodes may fail or be hacked, uh, but the, if everything went, goes well, the nodes that are not failing or being hacked, they will just simply follow the protocol. Uh, in, block, in blockchains, nodes are not part of the same company. Nodes maintaining the blockchains are all independent entities that cannot be directed by a company uh, to, to follow a protocol. Instead, they individually decide whether they are going to be better off you know, maximizing their payoff by following the protocol or deviating from that protocol. Uh, so, uh, so the protocol in order to be really implemented needs to be what we call incentive compatible so that every node will find it optimal to follow, uh, to follow the, the protocol. Okay. And that means that we need to use uh, economic modeling and think about economic incentives in the analysis of blockchain consensus using Byzantine fault tolerance. Uh, fault tolerant protocols. So this is what, what we are devising in this paper is such an economic model of Byzantine fault tolerant co uh, consensus. Uh, what we do in our model is that is we characterize all equilibria 
And what we find is that not every design that would be a, a design achieving consensus under a traditional database, a distributed database, uh, not every such design is going to achieve consensus in the presence of rational agents that are individually profit maximizing, pay of maximizing when deciding to follow protocol. And um, different designs of the protocol differ in how costly they are. This is something that is not considered by traditional uh, distributed databases. I mean, there's always a cost of the system, but there is no need for cost of incentives. Whereas here, because we need to incentivize the nodes to follow the protocol, we need to pay them for achieving consensus in a way and punish them for not achieving consensus. And that brings cost to the system. So, uh, so we show how the design of a, of a protocol affects the uh, system costs of incentives needed for consensus, for achieving consensus in equilibrium. And kind of one example of what we are um, showing in the paper or what our results lead to is that in traditional Byzantine fault tolerant protocols, it is recommended that nodes should send and forward messages as much as they can, in a sense, you know, with probability one. And uh, if they cannot with probability one, if there is some loss of messages, then you should, uh, you should, you should send it as quickly as, as much as you can. If you can only send it with probability 0 0.9, send it with 0 0.9. We don't want to lose messages or restrict messages on purpose. But we show that if there is message loss and the messages cannot be sent perfectly, it may be prohib prohibitively costly to achieve reliable consensus if the messages are sent with probability 0 0.99. So this is kind of paradoxical. It, may, it, it turns out that lowering the probability with which the messages are sent, for example, to one half, may achieve consensus at the lower system costs. Okay. So uh, you know, how are we showing uh, such results? Uh, we start uh, with the traditional Byzantine fault tolerant protocol that go back to the 80s where distributed uh, compute, computer nodes communicate with each other in order to reach consensus, but they only get this uh, decide whether to update their local databases or their local ledger uh, based on the local information. They don't really know what other nodes are seeing, but they need to make sure that they are all going to update it in the same way, because this is what consensus is. Uh, we, uh, they need to do it in the presence of Byzantine nodes that may uh, behave arbitrarily. They may be sending, um, sending messages or not sending messages. They may or may not deviate from the protocol. Um, and the traditional, uh, a traditional uh, uh, distributed database, uh, traditional Byzantine fault tolerant protocol used for distributed databases stipulate that uh, non-Byzantine nodes uh, are going to follow the strategies prescribed by the protocol in an honest way. Uh, so this is a kind of a system that is used widely in tech companies. Uh, we wouldn't have Amazon, we wouldn't have Facebook, we wouldn't have Google without uh, very extensive use of distributed databases and, uh, and consensus protocols. Um, in this paper, we acknowledge that in blockchain, we can no longer assume that uh, the nodes, honest nodes who have not been hijacked, uh, will just simply follow the strategy. Uh, instead, we assume that non-Byzantine nodes are rational, they individually maximize their payoff. Um, and they also, you know, of course, need to worry about what the Byzantine nodes are doing. And uh, now they need to form beliefs about what the Byzantine uh, uh, nodes are doing. So we are going to keep um, uh, in line with the traditional computer science um, approach. And we're going to assume that, um, uh, or the rational nodes are going to be assuming that Byzantine strategies are the worst possible, the worst case scenario. So uh, we formulate it using ambiguity aversion about Byzantine strategies. So our analysis is based on a, a simple uh, game that we call consensus game that is heavily influenced by the by computer uh, computer science uh, setup. So we have um, a measure of n of computer nodes. Uh, for simplicity uh, of derivations, we use continuous uh, of continuum of computers uh, rather than discrete number. But we have a measure we can be approximated and we can have a measure n of computer nodes. 
nature randomly selects one node as a leader and all other nodes are uh, designed, uh, uh, this, uh, denoted as backups. And leader decides uh, whether to send a message to each of the of a backup or with which probability to send a message to each of the backup. And uh, the message can be either, you know, do we attack or we don't attack as in classical Byzantine uh, generals problem, or it could be a new batch of transactions in the blockchain. So what is important is that every single uh, node, computer node, has its own ledger of transaction, its own blockchain. And now as the new uh, transactions are supposed to be added to the blockchain, there is no the blockchain. We are adding something to the blockchain if every single node individually decides to add those transactions to, the, uh, to their local copy of the ledger. So the leader decides to send them the message uh, with some probability. Uh, and then the, each computer, backup computer node uh, receiving a message from the leader decides whether to forward this to other nodes. And after this communication stage, each node collects the number of messages that they received from the leader and from other, uh, from other backups. And they decide whether to commit message it means write it to their own uh, local ledger, let's say that the new set of transactions or not. But they need to dis decide it on the, based on their local information. They don't know what the other nodes uh, know. Okay? And if everybody decides to uh, add the message to their ledger, the commit message, then we are achieving consensus. So this is what we are, what we are after. Okay? The uh, problem is that a measure F of the nodes are Byzantine and they may take arbitrary actions. They may not forward, not forward it at the same, at the same rate. Um, the, the messages may withhold it or they may send many more messages. Okay? Um, and they may spoil our uh, protocol achieving consensus. And uh, it would be of course easy if we knew which nodes are Byzantine, uh, but in fact, we don't know which are Byzantine. And therefore, we need to devise a strategy that is going to help us achieve consensus in the presence of those Byzantine nodes. So the remaining um, measure n minus f of nodes are rational, and they maximize utilities. And this is a, this new element that is not present in the, in the traditional distributed databases. So if a, if a consensus on a message is achieved, then uh, every node that uh, committed message uh, that uh, receives receives a reward R, like a payout. And you know, let me here make a, uh, make a connection to to proof of work. Even though here we are talking about Byzantine uh, uh, fault tolerant, but in proof of work, the reward for achieving consensus is this mining reward that the miner can later spend because it's still on the blockchain. Um, but in other in other blockchains, also the, the nodes, verifier nodes, need to be uh, incentivized to participate in the system. If, however, the node committed, uh, committed the message, but the consensus failed, now we have this different, uh, different ledgers that create discrepancy, that creates forks, that creates inconsistency. There is a cost uh, of, this, uh, of, of the failed, uh, of the, of the failed um, of committing when the consensus failed, when other did not commit. Uh, if they do not commit the message, they get a, a benchmark payoff of zero. And we say that consensus succeeded if uh, basically the measure n minus f of rational nodes commit. Uh, if it would be discrete, we would say all rational nodes commit. In a, in a um, continuous world, uh, world, we say that measure n minus f commits. Uh, so with this setup, uh, we are getting a game that is both kind of dynamic, a game with imperfect information uh, that, gets, uh, uh, that gets elements of coordination because we want to commit when everybody else commits and we don't want to commit when, nobody else, when, when others don't commit. And it also it has this communication uh, phase that may be chip talk or may be informative or may be chip talk because it's not costly to. So uh, we use uh, uh, a solution concept that we are using. It's perfect Bayesian equilibrium with uh, multipliers over Byzantine strategies. It is a, a kind of mouthful, uh, but the reason why we are getting this, uh, these different elements is because we need to make assumptions about what Byzantine, how to evaluate Byzantine strategies. 
they can take any actions. And uh, we say like, we, 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 again, we take it from computer science literature that they can just say, uh, just presenting notes can observe what rational notes I know they can uh, coordinate. It can be one attacker taking um, uh, advantage of multiple hijack nodes. So uh, there are many different uh, possibilities in terms of Byzantine strategies. And we don't know what are, the, what are the probabilities over those strategies. So instead, the rational nodes are going to assume the worst case scenario. So they are going to assume for anything that they see, for any information sets that they can observe, they assume that Byzantine nodes behave in a way that is worse for their payoffs. Um, so this is where we formally can express it with, this, with the maximization of a min, min function. Right? So in this environment, we are characterizing all symmetric equilibria. We start with a, 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 any, with a candidate uh, symmetric equilibrium. And symmetric equilibrium means that a rational leader sends message to each backup with the same probability, P. A rational backup forwards a message if received with the same probability Q to all other nodes. And then uh, based, on the, uh, based on the number of messages that the, that the nodes uh, receive, they will uh, either commit or not. And we need to specify for which number of messages they will want to commit and for which number of messages they will not want to commit. Right? And that may also depend on whether they got the message from um, the message from the leader or not. Right? So what we find is that um, so-called gridlock equilibrium always exists. And this is an equilibrium where nobody ever commits, no matter how many messages they receive. And that is kind of an um, interesting finding because that means that we can always have stalled blockchains. Uh, and it's pretty amazing that a lot of them are not. Um, and, uh, and we are kind of interested in uh, conditions under which we actually do have consensus equilibria, which are uh, successful consensus equilibria that, that uh, help the blockchain progress. Okay. So in any candidate equilibrium, uh, we've given uh, probabilities P and Q, so the probability that the leader sends the message and the backups uh, forward the messages, uh, any rational node can make inferences based on the number of uh, messages that they receive. So they make, can make inferences about the leader. Uh, so first of all, if the leader is rational, then the number of, uh, uh, number of messages that the rational node uh, uh, is going to receive is going to depend on those probabilities P and Q, uh, and also on the, on the, uh, uh, on the measure of, uh, of non uh, on, the measure, on the measure of rational nodes. So the, um, because all the rational nodes are going to forward, uh, receive the message of probability P and forward it probability Q. And the, uh, and the Byzantine nodes can do whatever, but there's F of them. So they can, uh, if they receive the message from the rational leader, they can forward it with any probability between zero and Q. So what is important is that if a rational node gets a message outside of this uh, blue band, it knows that the leader is Byzantine for sure. If they receive the message within the band, the leader may be either rational or Byzantine. Byzantine, uh, a Byzantine leader can mimic a rational, uh, rational leader as well. Um, so, uh, so this is the infer th those are the inferences about the leader, but the, uh, there are also inferences about how many uh, messages other nodes uh, have, uh, have received given that uh, I have received K messages. So we know that whenever, uh, whenever I receive K messages, everybody else needs to receive uh, K minus F or K plus F messages and not anything outside. And this F is if the leader is uh, Byzantine, if we would know that the leader is rational, then this band is much narrower. So we can make those inferences. Based on those inferences, we can, uh, we can derive the, uh, the properties of the, of the consensus uh, equilibrium. So we know that um, we, we, uh, we're, we're, we're showing and we find out that uh, rational nodes are going to uh, commit only if they receive uh, messages within the bounds that come from rational leader. So consistent with rational leader. 
and it comes from two, for, from two properties. First, a rational backup who knows that the leader is Byzantine is not going to commit because uh, going to perceive uh, payoffs min minus C. And this we show by uh, iterated deletion of dominated strategies. And Jason, I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A. Um, but, uh, but this is pretty standard uh, economic analysis. Um, it is, of course, uh, uh, if, the, if the leader is uh, Byzantine, nobody wants to commit. But there's this interval where the leader may be Byzantine or rational. So how about this interval? Right? Will the nodes want to, want to commit or not? So we also show that if some nodes want to commit within this interval, uh, then all the nodes want to commit within, the, within this, the whole interval. So it's either committing in the whole interval or not. And so will they commit or not? Well, the answer is maybe. First of all, we show that it's always an equilibrium. The gridlock equilibrium is always an equilibrium. So we always can end up in this bad equilibrium that nobody wants to commit. Um, but we also derive conditions where we can get the full, uh, we can get this good consensus equilibrium. And whether we are going to get this consensus equilibrium or not uh, will depend on the reward and penalty. So on the payoffs. And this is where design of the blockchain comes in, right? So this is, I know, a busy slide, but this is to say that we find three types of, uh, of equilibria. There is a gridlock equilibrium that I mentioned, but there are also two types of consensus equilibria. And uh, one, you know, I will start with a singleton uh, of what we call a singleton equilibrium. And this is basically an equilibrium where the rational leader sends a message to each backup with probability one. Um, and then, uh, and then the rational uh, nodes are of, uh, are committing when they receive a message from the leader, and they receive the number of messages within the interval. There is this one possible point when they may may uh, commit if they don't receive the message from the leader, but generally they only commit if they receive a message from the leader. Uh, there is also this interval E zero equilibria. And this is where rational leader sends a message to each backup with some interior probability, not with probability one. And then the, uh, the rational nodes uh, only decide whether to commit or not, only on based on the num total number of messages. They are not looking anymore whether they got the message from the leader or not. Uh, now, something that I want to emphasize here in this busy slide with those two types of consensus equilibria is the differences in conditions where we get, when we get those equilibria. So the, there are different conditions on the payoffs, on the, on the reward and the penalty. And the uh, singleton equilibrium requires much lower reward to be achieved than, and, and then uh, the interval, interval equilibrium. So in order to get an equilibrium, where the leader uh, sends the probability sends a message with probability less than one, we actually need to get uh, need to get a higher R. Need to pay more the nodes for achieving equilibrium. What is even more interesting is that if we want this probability uh, to include very high number, so either very low number or very high number, we need to further increase R. So if we want uh, the probability uh, we want to have an equilibrium uh, where the leader sends the message with probability 0 0.99. This is going to require very high reward in order to uh, to get the uh, to incentivize the the nodes to commit. Okay. So, what does it mean for the uh, for equilibria for the for the blockchain protocol? Uh, the blockchain protocol would very often prescribe certain strategy. This would be a default action, default blockchain client. And it would say, well, send a message with that probability, forward message with the other probability, commit message and update your ledger with uh, if you get messages within that interval. And for that, you are going to get a certain reward or punishment if the consensus uh, doesn't work. And uh, and uh, what we what we what we do, we basically say, well, 
uh, nodes are going to follow that protocol and that protocol is going to work well. Nobody's going to deviate and reprogram their client. If the proto if the um, if the uh, the variables or the the variables that the protocol prescribes are constituting an equilibrium, so this is incentive compatible, and for that, depending on what is p what is the uh, probability of sending messages or uh, forwarding the messages, we need to uh, offer different R's for different uh, p's and q's. So we are asking, you know, which of those protocols would be more expensive or less expensive. And it's clear that if we can get the messages to be sent by the leader of probability one and uh, go for the single tone equilibrium, then we're going to have the cheapest possible protocol. Uh, however, uh, if we cannot achieve P equals one and we are constrained to some lower probability of sending messages, then the most, the, the second cheapest, uh, uh, cheapest protocol would be asking the leader to send the message only with probability one half, not, not 0 0.9, 0 0.9. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip that slide uh, unless we want to discuss it later on um, why this is the case. But basically the idea is that if you send the message with probability 0 0.999, then all those users who did not get the message they will assign very high probability that the leader is actually Byzantine and they will not want to commit unless they are incentivized by high reward. Right. Um, and this result is important because you, know, you can say, well, so why don't we always just ask the nodes to send the message with probability one and why wouldn't it be uh, the optimal of a protocol? It would be if we can achieve it. But in many systems, there is some probability of losing messages. And if we lose messages, then uh, relying on probability equals one is no longer possible. And then we are getting into the into the uh, uh, into um, equilibria that are interval equilibria because singleton equilibrium no longer exists. Um, unfortunately, the gridlock equilibrium always exists, so it still exists when we have message loss. So that means that we are, will need much higher R, much higher reward to be paid to the, to the nodes in a blockchain if there is message loss. And we can lower this R if we are going to lower the probability with which the, the leader is sending a message to the backups, okay? Let me do it like this. Um, so, you know, to, to sum up, why does it all matter? Uh, well, first of all, operational success of any blockchain depends on its design. And uh, we are contributing here to explaining what are the important elements of the design. And especially for blockchains that are using Byzantine fault tolerant consensus protocols, uh, we show that accounting for incentives that are very important in blockchains and were not important in traditional databases. Um, and then uh, we, first of all, it, uh, achieve the grid gridlock equilibra again, which were not the case in traditional da databases. Um, and there are other concerns about multiple, multiplicity of equilibria. Uh, small probability of message loss will significantly affect the equilibria and the cost of the well-working uh, consensus protocol. And uh, uh, finally, we provide guidance on the cost of incentives needed to achieve consensus in blockchain. And we show that uh, it is less costly when protocol asks for sending message with probability one half than with probability 99%. Uh, and this is a recommendation that is different from traditional Byzantine fault tolerant protocols. So uh, let me stop here, Jason, and uh, over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. That was uh, really fascinating. From what I understand, you have certain uh, problem, problematic equilibria, like uh, the gridlock equilibrium, which is something that, you know, that you'd like to avoid. Uh, in, uh, in in some of the situations you've described. And so I was wondering if, since a lot of this, uh, a lot of your model involves information exchange, is there any potential role that data quality or you know data exchange mechanisms using data from outside of a blockchain uh, can, can play in avoiding some of the issues that you discuss, some of the kind of the, the bad equilibria that you discuss? Or, or is it just, um, 
is it more kind of like internal to the system, you know, is it information exchange internal to the system rather than, uh, you know, kind of using information outside of it? Does that make sense? Well, yeah, so I would say, so first of all, uh, you know, we modeled a, a very basic problem of getting information that comes from outside, right? And then uh, having a system agreeing on this information in a way or updating it in a consistent way because a new a message comes from outside. So this is, you get this, in, you get information from an Oracle and now this new transaction needs to update a smart contract on every single node, right? So this would be, um, and, uh, and the system that we are modeling does not have any coordination device. So if you would imagine that in our system, we have this external coordination device, external source of information that is showing all the nodes at the same time, like, oh, message, leader's message is this and this, then we don't have a problem. The problem arises because we have peer-to-peer -peer network where everybody connects, connects to their neighbors and maybe even everybody connects to everybody else, but they get individual messages. There is no kind of broadcast where we know exactly that everybody else had seen it. So think about, you know, you see a commercial, I may have not seen it, Justin may have seen it or not, yeah, yeah. right? I but if the commercials not. displayed at the Super Bowl, you know, in halftime, and we more or less know everybody had seen the commercial, right? So this is a kind of a, 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 a more visible uh, information. So, so here I would say that we are looking at even more fundamental problem uh, that, that, uh, that, that says whether the information comes from oracles or not, if we cannot guarantee that everybody sees the same thing and we still need to agree, then we are subject to the same consensus issues. Yeah, if I, if I can add a, a, a few things, I think that like external information that off-chain information may actually be a double-edged sword. Because on the one hand, uh, it may help uh, with the coordination, but also on the other hand, it may also serve as a sunspot that may lead people to coordinate on the undesirable outcome. So I'll give one example, right? So like we have seen examples recently, for example, with Solana and a bunch of other different blockchains that uh, it just, the chain gets stalled and they kind of roll back some of their updates. And what that happens is that just uh, maybe just to the extent that some of the uh, applications are somewhat centralized so that the developers basically just announce, okay, now we're going to re restart and uh, uh, restart and roll back some of the recent updates. And you can view that as it's kind of an external information that is off the chain, but somehow because uh, they are somehow uh, people just listen to them, right? So you cannot actually coordinate on a different equilibrium. So I think that the, the exist, existence of multiple equilibrium in a coordination flavor type of game is pretty inherent. So it's, I think, and also like in economics, when we say that like there are the coordination device, we sometimes call it sunspot. If you think about sunspot, it's really something outside of the, outside of the system. And the sunspot can really coordinate you on either the good one or bad one. So I, so to sum up, I think it's kind of a external information, maybe a double-edged sword. So would you say that maybe if there was a, a means of kind of validating external information, that that would probably be helpful in terms of reducing cost uh, and getting you towards a better equilibrium, or would, would that not make a difference? So I guess there are two things, if validating information and uh, making sure that I know that, that if I sow this information, you also sow this information, right? So we, we go back to the same problem. So let me give you an example because I, I think it's not intuitive. So a, a lot of modeling of um, blockchains uh, generally because economists started getting interested in distributed databases only when they become blockchain, became blockchains uh, for the incentives issues. Um, a lot of the, the models assume, okay, we have and notes, and if half of them vote that the transaction is valid, then we are going to um, add this transaction to the blockchain. Sounds simple, right? But think about how is this voting is done. Typically, we think there is a voting booth, and all nodes are sending their votes to this particular voting booth. But then we need to trust this voting booth to collect the, collect the, the information 
and then send out confirmation to everyone that this is the outcome of the voting. And if you think about elections in democratic countries, this having this um, trusted voting booth is not a trivial thing, right? Uh, you have committees and supervisors and, uh, you know, and, and, and all sorts of things. And the same thing in the in electronic world, right? And it would be trivial if we could see everybody's vote, but we can't and we cannot assure even that the confirmation from the voting booth is going to reach all the other nodes. And this is what, what, what creates this problem with making decision uh, that, uh, that we want to make decision the same as everybody else, but we only have, a local, have local information. We only know what we know. So could you, uh, just kind of adding to that, could you maybe explain what the uh, role of smart contracts would be in a system like this? Like what, what role would this play in leading uh, the kind of the group towards a, uh, a beneficial equilibrium? Or what role would it play more generally in the in the kind of economic model that you uh, that you discuss, like in in the real world, you know, the situation? So uh, I may I may share some of my thoughts. I think uh, the power of a smart contract actually hugely relies on how successful the underlying consensus is, right? Because the smart contract operates on a blockchain. And if there, for example, if the, the consensus stuck, gets stuck so that no progress is made, then the smart contract cannot automatically uh, uh, change the state of the, the blockchain world. So I think that actually, I think I'll also further emphasize that it's important for us to look into the incentives of, of participants in the consensus process, because only that part, when that part works well, would the power of smart contract be fully unleashed? So could you maybe describe a situation where an, an honest node would be uh, rational and maybe where a rational node would not be honest? Does that make sense? So, uh, so let me let me jump in here. So I think that we are getting uh, 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 getting it, so semantics is getting into uh, into the way and then and this is because when we think honest, you know, we assign moral value to it, and this is this is the this is the meaning of the word of the word in natural language. Uh, the way we define honest, uh, and this is it, kind of goes goes from the uh, uh, goes 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 back to the computer science literature, are the um, nodes that follow the protocol. They follow the protocol. They could be, you know, they could be called naive. Uh, they could be, you know, they just blindly follow the protocol because it was written this way. And this is why in our model, in, in our, not only our formulation, the rational nodes are not honest. Does not mean that they are cheating, uh, but they are not blindly following the protocol. So I, I don't know, maybe we can come up with a better word, uh, a better term that is not going to be uh, confusing, uh, you know, when we use it in natural language, but basically those are mutually exclusive. Uh, what is true is that in, um, in real environment, we may have some players, some nodes who are just following the protocol because they are not even calculating what would be the benefit of uh, reprogramming the client, uh, the, the, the blockchain client and changing its, its, its actions and strategies. And, uh, or maybe they don't have capability to do it. So we may have some nodes that are honest and some nodes that, that are, you know, ac actively engaging in strategic behavior, which means that they will only follow the protocol if it's beneficial to them and not just because the protocol says so. But what we are showing is that, first of all, if we have a protocol that is an equilibrium with rational nodes, then if part of those non-Byzantine nodes, only part of them are rational, so kind of strategically calculating, and the, rem the remainder are honest and they will just follow the protocol, it still will be the same equilibrium. So, so kind of one, one example I, I, I some, sometimes think about is think about like a four-way stop sign. Right, so like according to, if you are an honest guy, you will follow the rule. Whenever you got, get to a four-way stop sign, you should stop, okay? But if you, you think about if you are rational and you think about, okay, if you believe all other people are, are honest, they will always stop at the four-way stop sign. Why should I stop? Because there's not gonna be any accident, right? Because they will always stop. So I just go through that stop sign. So this is a kind of an illustration about if I believe other people are honest, 
then from my rational perspective, I actually may not obey the rule. So I think the distinction here is really about, we wanna make sure the protocol is designed in such a way so that you will not just stop at the stop sign because you are told to do so, but also based on your careful calculation, you know that it's actually optimal for you if, because if you do not do that, accidents may happen and you may get hurt. So think about uh, uh, all uh, four-way stop sign and pedestrian crossing. Then you are going to stop, even if you know that everybody else stops. I understand. So the key is, is designing a system where uh, it's always rational for the node to follow the protocol, um, given yeah. their incentives. Exactly. Right. So this is what we call incentive compatible. Gotcha. gotcha. People, people behave. So in a way, they end up behaving honestly because it's in their best interest. Right. And that's uh, the incentive compatibility, as I understand it, is a concept from, uh, from mechanism design. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, very much so. Great. Game theory is more, gen more general. Yeah. Um, well, that's pretty much all the questions that I have, uh, Dr. Halliburton and Dr. Lee. Thank you so much for joining me today on uh, Chainlink Research Reports. Uh, that's pretty much it. And, uh, you know, looking forward to uh, seeing you again in the future. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. It thank was you so a much pleasure. for having us.